Our next speaker is going to be Dr. Carol Stoker. Uh, Carol uh, was one of the original founders of the Mars Underground at the University of Colorado in 1981, um, which began uh, the movement that ultimately resulted in uh, the Mars Society. Uh, she was a grad student at uh, University of Colorado then, but subsequently went to NASA Ames, where she became a, a research scientist, uh, working on various technologies associated with Mars exploration. Um, and in fact, I believe she has a talk tomorrow in which she's going to talk about some of her own technical work in that area concerning uh, drilling on uh, Mars. But tonight, uh, what she's going to do is review uh, the latest discoveries in, in Mars exploration because, you know, since 1996, we've had a string of mostly successful probes going to Mars, and they've made a string of discoveries which collectively have really altered our picture as to what we might find on Mars and what there is to be discovered on Mars. And while we've had a variety of, of presentations here at this conference covering one or another, um, I think it's important that it be pulled together. And so, uh, Carol Stoker. Well, I'm uh, <clears throat> very honored to have been on the same podium with Jack Schmidt, one of the greatest American heroes alive today. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, what's new on Mars? Um, one of the uh, things that's new is uh, actually old. This is a, um, I don't know if we're going to be able to hear this. It's uh, a little clip out of the uh, 1964 science fiction movie that was, uh, 1964 is prior to the very first Mars mission, prior to Mariner 7. Robinson Crusoe on Mars made an incredible prediction. So unfortunately, as I was afraid, we can't hear it. Um, so what he's saying is, um, what are these yellow rocks? Why do they burn like coal? They seem to be full of oxygen. I have to store them. Unfortunately, uh, the sound is not being picked up. I was afraid of that. Um, he's sitting next to a fire where he's burning these rocks. So here we are in uh, 2013. Um, Danny Glavin, as one of the SAM observations, reported uh, the presence of perchlorate. Uh, it was actually confirming an earlier uh, discovery of perchlorate from uh, Mike Hecht, who was part of the Phoenix mission discovery. Uh, so both these papers uh, indicate that there's approximately 1% by mass perchlorate on the surface of Mars. Well, why is that interesting? Uh, this is the chem chemical formula for perchlorate. As you can see, there's a chlorine molecule, four oxygen molecules, and up to eight water molecules. Um, at the eutectic mixture, so this is a salt. You can mix water and salt together until you can't mix any more salt into the water. That's the eutectic. At the eutectic, perchlorate will lower the freezing point of water to minus 68 degrees centigrade. This is a low enough temperature to make water flow on most of the surface of Mars today. Um, it is a very, very highly hygroscopic, produces uh, what's called deliquescence. What that means is that at lower than 100% relative humidity, it will cause water to condense onto the perchlorate grains. You can actually watch this in a microscope. You can watch as the humidity increases up to about 50%, the, the crystals of perchlorate start to swell and become water drops. Um, it is a very strong oxidant. It can oxidize organic matter, and as you'll see, uh, it can explain a lot of what else we've been seeing. Um, it can be used as an oxidant for rocket fuel. In fact, it is used for that on Earth. And very importantly, it's an energy source for microbial metabolism. Many microbes can eat it. So um, next big discovery, nitrates. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things about is a lot of these big new discoveries, the first author of the papers are young early career researcher women, something I'm personally very fond of. <laughs> so uh, Jen Stern actually talked about this today. She was a speaker. 
Um, that nitrate has been identified um, definitively in the uh, drill samples and actually some of the finds that weren't drilled um, at the Curiosity, in the Curiosity rover traverse. Um, <coughs> Uh, uh, the average concentration, kind of average of these um, numbers down here is 300 parts per million. And that's the windblown dust, so it isn't necessarily uh, even have to go underground. There are nitrates in the soil. That's important. Um, why is that interesting? Well, nitrate is a form of fixed nitrogen, meaning it's not nitrogen gas. Uh, Fixed nitrogen is very important for life. When you put fertilizer on your garden, it's got nitrate in it, almost certainly. Uh, there are some microbes that can fix nitrogen, but it's not every microbe, and it takes a lot of energy. There are very specialized microbes that can do it. But because Mars has only 2% nitrogen in its atmosphere versus 80% on Earth, uh, the availability of fixed nitrogen was often in question. In fact, when I was a graduate student, Penny Boston was doing experiments trying to determine could microbes fix nitrogen at 2% concentration. Um, so it's, uh, the availability of fixed nitrogen is important for assessing the habitability of Mars. Um, however, nitrate is not terribly surprising because it has been um, seen in the Martian meteorites. Uh, Phoenix had the intention to measure nitrate, but the measurement was foiled by the presence of perchlorate. It turned out the nitrate electrode was also sensitive to perchlorate. So, in fact, uh, nitrate is less abundant than perchlorate. Um, on Earth, there, perchlorate and nitrate actually are found in a uh, constant ratio almost everywhere on Earth. Uh, in the Atacama, there's more than in other kinds of soils. Um, but so 10,001, 10,000 uh, nitrates for every perchlorate. On Mars, it's actually the other way around. There are 100 uh, perchlorates for every nitrate, um, at least based on that observation. So um, discovery number three. Um, Methane. <laughs> Curiosity rover detects variable levels of methane on Mars. And I should point out again, uh, this is the um, current, uh, most current detection. Um, Peter Webster and the SAM team um, in science in 2015 uh, found a background level of about, just about a part per billion, but a variable level of five to 10 parts per billion. Um, high methane was detected on four separate observations over a 60 sol period. So what, what this is doing is this is taking the SAM instrument and just sucking in atmosphere and measuring what's in the atmosphere. And boom, there's methane in the atmosphere. Um, there had been previous reports going all the way back to Mars Express in 2004, uh, ground-based, couple of ground-based observations that had reported it. And every time, the community sort of questioned, can this be for real? This has got to be instrumental error. This has got to be noise. This just can't possibly be uh, what we're seeing. Well, why is it interesting? Um, it's produced biologically. It can be produced abiologically in a reaction called the serpentinization reaction, uh, which is a water rock reaction with certain kind of mineral, serpentine. Um, but it is actually means there's got to be that rock and water around. Um, methane from either source could be so stored and episodically vented. Um, the uh, lifetime of methane in the Mars atmosphere to ultraviolet destruction is 300 years. Due to wind, any local methane plume should be quickly globalized. So varying methane signatures are very puzzling. Why should the methane go up and down? It has to be plumes. Um, the only way that you could get an exogenous source to explain the, the uh, observation from Curiosity is if you had a 
a sort of an unrealistic scenario where you brought in a bulleye that had a lot of methane in it and 1% was released over 60 sols. And it would have to happen in Gale Crater and there's no recent crater, which you can see from high rise. Um, so the variable methane is best explained by occasional local plumes and they have to be in Gale Crater. So, um, the next big discovery, organics found on Mars. Um, so this is red Mars, this is gray Mars. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> drill, stone, drill holes in the sheet bed mudstone show that uh, the material below the surface is actually not oxidized, it's reduced. And the uh, analysis from the Kemen instrument shows that there are both oxidized and reduces phase, reduced phases of iron and uh, sulfur minerals. The uh, organics, the um, understanding of the organics uh, and the presence of organics and finally getting a paper published on this fell to a young early career researcher at Goddard named Carolyn Frissonet, <laughs> a postdoc, um, who had to try to unravel the very complicated set of reactions that are going on between the samples and the perchlorate in the samples because the way the SAM instrument works is it brings in the sample and it heats up, it's, it's actually the same way the Viking GCMS worked. You bring in the sample, you volatilize it with heat, and when you volatilize organics in the presence of perchlorate, they burn. Exactly like predicted in the movie <laughs> from 1964. So um, it took a lot of working with the data to reproduce and show that in blanks you could actually get more of this reaction product, which is these chlorinated uh, hydrocarbon compounds, then you would, get, um, you would get more from the sample than you would get from blanks. And um, so kudos to Carolyn Frissonet for working it out. Um, so uh, the samples, the rock nest sample doesn't show any. The rock nest sample is a, a fine just scooped up off the ground. Uh, some of the other drill holes don't seem to show it either, but one of them seems to show it quite convincingly. So um, one of the things that I find puzzling is that John Klein, which is one of the drill holes, and Cumberland, which is another, were only two meters apart. One of them seems to show convincingly organics and the other does not. So that's a puzzle. So why is organics interesting? Well, as, I, uh, as Gil Levin has pointed out, it was actually the non-detection of organics that led to the interpretation of the Viking biology experiments as not resulting from life. Um, again, resulting from thermal volatilization. Um, in 2010, Rafael Navarro-Gonzalez and colleagues suggested that the Viking chlorinated hydrocarbons were actually a result of organics reacting with perchlorate. Um, and that, I think, has been borne out by what the SAM organic instrument is seeing. The SAM organic analysis, however, is even more complicated because realizing that this reaction with uh, perchlorate might become an issue, the SAM team brought an organic, a very, very complex organic molecule that was supposed to be used to um, extract the organics out of the soil. Um, this is the organic molecule. Well, it turns out that the cuvettes that they brought with them of this organic molecule have leaked. So the instrument itself is contaminated and figuring out what, the, what is noise and what is signal has been a very, very tough job. But uh, at least the evidence now is um, pretty strong that they've, they are seeing organics in the samples. Okay, discovery number five. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, rocks with very high concentrations of manganese oxide are found on Mars. Um, this shows the this, uh, detection is with the ChemCam instrument, and once again, the lead author on the paper is an early career female researcher um, at Los Alamos. 
Um, so uh, what they are seeing, and you can see these uh, different colored dots on this diagram here. Uh, basically, ChemCam is a laser and zaps the rocks, makes little holes in the rocks, and uh, vaporizes a very tiny amount of the surface of the rock, which is then uh, analyzed with a spectrometer. This is a uh, laser-induced breakdown spectrometer. So what they are seeing in some of these rocks, the ones with the yellow dots, are up to like 90% manganese oxide on the rock. These are exorbitant numbers. Um, so why are rocks with high manganese interesting? Well, formation of manganese oxide requires very oxidizing conditions. Uh, they were formed on Earth only after the rise of an oxygen atmosphere, which occurred about a billion years ago. <laughs> so Gale Crater rocks are much older than that. They're like three and a half billion years old. Um, <clears throat> this would imply, if they are remnant from the early history of Mars, that Gale Crater must have had highly oxidizing conditions very early in Mars history. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that the manganese oxide appears to be a coating, and this is another paper by Dr. Lanza showing uh, lab results from um, analog samples where um, She's looking at desert varnish examples as analogs for the rocks that have been found on Mars. And basically, these uh, desert varnishes are thought to be biologically mediated. So it's another kind of interesting point. Um, <clears throat> I seem to have two copies of that. They aren't just in the uh, Curiosity Gale Crater area. Um, the famous jelly donut you might have heard about, um, which was basically a rock that was kicked into the field of view of uh, the Mars Exploration Rover. Um, <clears throat> so here's a before and after. Where did this rock come from? Suddenly the rock appears. <laughs> so eventually they figured out that the rover had kicked it up. But you see this dark stuff in the center. That is actually high manganese as well. So apparently there are rocks all over Mars that have high manganese content high manganese oxide content. OK, big discovery number six, um, recurring slope linea in equatorial Mars. Um, <clears throat> this is a picture of where are the dominant number of recurring slope linea identified. And the new thing is that there have now been a number of them um, identified near the equator, some of them actually in the deep canyons of the Valles Marineris. Um, there are now 12 confirmed uh, RSLs in the uh, equatorial tropics, sort of minus 25 to plus 25 degrees. Um, <clears throat> so why are RSLs interesting? So what RSLs are is they are Things that move down slope, they look for all the world like water is flowing down a slope. Um, there are now 25 confirmed recurring slope linea identified in various locations, and another 20 that are partially confirmed. Now, the confirmation is a process that the, uh, the, the team from the high rise uh, orbital imager, this is the team that has identified these things, uses to decide how much confidence they have in the observation. Uh, and it, it's the number of times they see it repeated in the observations, basically. Um, they are predominantly in the southern hemisphere where the peak surface temperatures are highest because perihelion currently occurs near summer solstice um, in, the, in the south. So they only occur in low albedo regions, which are absorbing more heat from the sun and are free of insulating dust. They're typically seen on steep slopes, greater than 30 degree slopes. Those are, if you're climbing a mountain, you want rock climbing gear if you're on greater than 30 degree slope. Um, they terminate in sediment bands on slightly less steep slopes, 20 to 30 degrees. Uh, they begin to move at temperatures above 250 centigrade, that's minus 20. Uh, Sorry, that would be 250 Kelvin, so uh, minus 20 centigrade. And um, 
cease moving by temperatures of 300 Kelvin. Um, and in Valles Marineris, they actually correlate with the time that the slope gets the most sunlight. And I hope I can get this to work. So this is, this is my thing that isn't going to work. And I even got my slides onto uh, a uh, fancy <coughs> uh, PC disk so that I could show you this. But anyway, so the, uh, basically what you would see if this was working <laughs> is this is a movie. And as the uh, solar, subsolar point actually sort of moves around this crater, it's actually a crater that's been imaged over the uh, course of the summer as you go from spring to summer to fall. And the subsolar point goes from the south to the north. And when it's in the south, you can see the RSLs form and move down slope. And then as the subsolar point moves around to the north and it's the brightest spot in the north, the RSLs form and move down slope. And you can uh, download these pictures and see them yourself by going to the uh, High Rise website. There's a lot of movies of the RSLs, and they're really fascinating to watch. Um, and this was another one that unfortunately is also not going to work, which is a time, time lapse. This is actually reprojected, and it's the view of Caprates Chasma that you would have if you were standing on the ground looking up at the canyon wall. And what you see is, if you download this movie and watch it, is you see these things form and slide down the slope. And they actually are sliding down in this area, and they're terminating in these big, broad bands. So um, one, another interesting fact. So here's a, a better, at least a picture where you can see them. So these things, over time, you can watch them form and move down slope. Um, so this is showing what the temperatures are as a function of different slope directions uh, over time for a different, you know, the entire year. So this is basically different times of year. This is down to 360, um, three, 365, 360 degrees. So it's all the total year cycle is being represented here. Um, so basically, melting of shallow ground ice is the best fit to the observations. You can come up with you know, exotic things to maybe explain them, but ground ice melting is actually the best fit. So what does it all mean for life? It seems to me, I'm just a biologist, I'm not a geologist. <laughs> that all the ingredients to support modern ecosystems seem to be available on Mars now in locations that could be accessible to exploration. Not all of them are necessarily easily uh, reached. Um, there's liquid water, apparently, uh, periodically, uh, in the northern plains and in the uh, mid, uh, mid and low latitudes in the recurring slope linear. There are energy sources at the surface and subsurface in sunlight, perchlorate, nitrate, and organics. And by the way, either nitrate or perchlorate plus organics is all you need to eat if you are um, the right kind of microorganism. There's all the necessary nutrients, the schnapps, as um, sometimes they're called, and conditions that don't preclude growth. So should NASA be considering missions that search for modern life? <laughs> so I just have a plug for my talk tomorrow. I'm going to talk about the Icebreaker Life mission to Mars, which is in review for discovery right now. Um, and it is a mission to do just that. So that's my talk. Yeah, your comment about desert varnish was very interesting. I mean, I'm thinking it's manganese dioxide, right, the mineral pyrolusite that you're thinking that you see on those rocks. And for someone who spends a good part of my work week looking for the 
hidden biosphere on Earth, right? We've looked at desert varnish on Earth and have had a hard time finding definitive nucleic acid signatures. But when you say that Dennis desert varnish is on Earth regarded as a biosignature, have I missed something that is definitive in that respect? <coughs> um, I don't think I would call it definitive. It's thought to be a biosignature by a lot of people. I, it, there's certainly no um, uniform consensus. A thousand scientists, you know, it's not like global warming, you know. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but it it is more. Um, I hadn't. I didn't know that you can't find DNA from. Um, it's hard to find a definitive DNA. Right. Right. You always find DNA, but associated right. Definitively yeah. associated. Right. So the, as as I understand it, the evidence for that is actually SEM imaging. You, sir. <laughs> oh, I guess they have to give you the. Can you comment on the challenges of distinguishing between methane from biological origin and methane from geological origin and what we would need on Mars to be sure where those bursts come from? Not specifically geographically, I mean, but what type of origin? <coughs> um, I, I think that. The presence of methane by either source is very interesting because um, even if it's not biological, it, it indicates water rock, rock interactions or it's something that's been stored from an ancient reservoir. I think that if you could get to the source, um, you might be able to work out an isotopic um, abundance or an, uh, an isotopic fractionation explanation, or a way to interpret the I isotopic fractionation to determine whether it's biogenic or not. But as was pointed out earlier today, it's not, you can't just grab a, a sample, you know, one sample, and say, oh, its isotop ratio is this, therefore it must be that. You have to have, you have to understand what the entire, um, ecosystem or the whole uh, system itself, what its isotopic ratios are, and, and it's, it's a difficult problem. Um, yeah. Carol. Go ahead. This Rachel Tillman with the Viking Project Preservation. Um, because we know that the search for life really requires a lot of creativity as well as it does rigor in examining the potential environments that life might become, uh, might be present in now or, or might have been present. When we look for clues, we need to look for them in, an, in a multidisciplinary manner. And in, as a biologist, I know you do this. But I heard a clue that I thought was rather interesting, and it relates to nitrogen, which is not talked about as much, but was brought up earlier today. And that, and, and I wondered if you could respond to this and, and, and share if there might be some possible um, relevance. But I understand, I, I learned just a few years ago that this, the sunfish, which is one of those great big blobby fish that sits on the top of the water and occasionally dives to these insane depths and was thought to do so on rare occasion, was recently discovered to actually do multiple dives within a 24-hour period. Um, the, the marine biologists that I spoke to who made this discovery were interested in this as kind of a mechanical process. But I immediately thought about it as a scuba diver as, oh my god, this fish knows how to metabolize or organize within its own system nitrogen. So are we looking at some of those marine biology and other clues to identify different ways that life forms might be um, processing and metabolizing nitrogen, specifically? <clears throat> um, I don't know how to answer that, to be honest. Uh, there is certainly a lot of people doing research in um, extreme environments and looking at, you know, odd types of metabolism. Nitrogen specifically, I don't really think so. At least I haven't heard of that, but could be. Um, Gil Levin. On Earth, the limiting factor for growth is inorganic phosphate. Have you detected inorganic phosphate on Mars? Um, yes, I don't. I don't think phos. Well, 
the APX type measurements don't detect phosphate as such, they detect phosphorus, but phosphorus has certainly been detected. And it's present in the meteorites as well. So I don't think it's limiting. I mean, it, it probably isn't super abundant, so it might be limiting, but it's not that it's not available at all. 